So far, we've learned a lot of really important and fundamental concepts, not only in Apex, but in computer science and software engineering as a whole. And this section is going to be no different because we're going to be talking about classes. Classes can be a little bit tricky to describe. One of the most common ways you'll see that explained is that it's a blueprint. It is a definition of what will happen. I'll go into a concrete example here soon, but just to help ease you into the subject, it is something that we've been using already. Every time we've declared a variable, like a integer, a string, double, or decimal, those in Apex are classes. We're making a variable, giving it whatever name that we want based off the integer class or the string class. And that's why, like I showed in the integer and string videos, there are different methods that you could call on string or integer. So those are classes that Apex has made for you. But the really cool thing is that you can also make your own classes. And there's a lot of power behind that. Because what have we been doing so far? What has really been the focus? That is the modularization and compartmentalization of our code. And that is a very important thing to keep in mind when we as developers are writing code. Because it is not something that's inherently available to us with a lot of the out-of-the-box features. There's a concept out there called dry code. D-R-Y, dry. And it stands for don't repeat yourself. And that is super important when you become a developer because more often than not, you're writing code as a part of a really large code base. So there's a lot of functionality intermingled within all the different classes and methods that you're working on. And you're not always going to be the one writing the code. Maybe two years from now, someone else will be maintaining the code that you originally wrote. And it's important to keep that code really dry so you don't write the same logic in multiple places. If change needs to be made in the logic, there's just one place to go make that change. And because of that, there's a lot less code that needs to be reviewed and read and understood. Thanks to Sketch.io, I've put together a very sophisticated diagram for y'all. Let's say you're the developer for your company and they ask you to do some consulting work for a small business. And that small business is a cheese shop and they want to set up an e-commerce site where they can display the various cheeses that they sell, the name of the cheese, display the price of the cheese, and have some functionality on there where they can add some cheese to their cart and make, make a small purchase. Right off the bat, with no context whatsoever, we notice the similarities, right? I just named them off. Each one of these is kind of compartmentalized in its own piece. Each one of these compartments has a name, it has price, and it has to, an add to cart functionality. The only thing that's different are these values inside of it. But overall, the structure is the same. And that is a great use case for classes and that's exactly what it's designed to do. It's designed for you to make a blueprint of what is to become and what is to become is your object or your instance of that class. So if I were to create a blueprint of cheese, I would have a class called cheese. There would be some variable in there called name. There would be another variable in there called price. And there would be some method or some action called add to cart. And then just like the way that we instantiated and called our method multiple times, we can do the same thing for classes. And the same thing that we did for integers and strings, where we've declared multiple integers and strings, you can do for this to make four different instances of cheese. So let's say this is our cheese class. We want to store name and cost. So more than likely name will be a string and cost will be a double. And then we'll have a method. It doesn't necessarily need to return anything, at least not right now called add to cart. And just like that, we've created a class and we've designed a class that we can now go and implement. Well, so let's go do that. We're gonna stop working out of the anonymous window. We're gonna go to file new Apex class and let's give our class a name. So unlike variables, whenever you do write out a class name, it is not mandatory, but it's good practice to start your class's name, not with camel case, with an uppercase. So for this one, it doesn't apply, it's just called cheese, but if I had named this my cheeses, I wouldn't name it like this. I would capitalize the M like that and so forth. If only I could spell. There we go. So we're about to make a class called cheese. Cool. So Apex is nice enough to already do some stuff for us. It adds the access modifier, which is really similar to the ones we talked about in methods. It adds the keyword class, 
and then it gives my class a name. So what do we need? We need a string and we need a double. I'm going to call it name, double, price. So far so good. Look how quickly this is coming together. And then we need a method called add to cart. Okay. So within a class, since we were able to add variables, now let's try to add a method. And for this, I don't necessarily need any parameters right now. Add my scope and keeping it simple. I don't know how that happened. Uh, keeping it simple. Let's just put a system debug thing and add it to cart. You know, things are looking up. Things are looking good. This matches our diagram pretty well. So now let's create an object based off this class called cheese. So I'll make another class called cheese shop, same basic keywords added here. And to create a new cheese, to create a object of type cheese, what I'll need to do is type in the name of the class, really similar to how whenever we wanted an integer, we would type the name of that class. So it's the same thing. Let's call this one cheddar and use the assignment operator, type in the keyword new, and follow it again with the name of the class called cheese. What's happening behind the scenes here is a new instance of cheese is created, and it's set to the value of cheddar cheese. So we can say this is our object. This is the living, breathing version of cheese. What we could do is create this class multiple times, one for cheddar cheese, one for mozzarella cheese, and let's Stop it there. So now we have our cheeses. Hmm, how do I set name and how do I set price, right? I mean, all I've done is create this, but these don't have any values. So how do I get them values? For that, we can create a special method called a constructor. A constructor gets called automatically whenever we create a new instance or create an object of a class. So Salesforce handles it and it calls it for us. The way we can create a constructor is by using the public keyword or the private keyword. But the important part is that we name this method of the constructor the same thing as the class at our squiggly braces. And now what we can do from here is pass in as parameters values into this constructor and have the constructor set the values of this class. But this is where it gets a little bit tricky because again, this is just a blueprint. This doesn't actually exist. It's this that exists. This is just a definition of what is to exist. That is where the this operator comes in. What this does, it says, listen, I know there might be a whole lot of different classes out there like cheddar cheese, mozzarella cheese, and Parmesan cheese. So I don't want you to get distracted or lose track of which one I'm talking about. So this is the keyword that references this particular instance of a class. So what we can do now is say this, dot name from there and similarly this dot price equal to let's say we passed in some parameters into this method called string cheese name and double cheese price and I could take cheese name and I can take cheese price and set it just like that so now if I were to pass in these two variables into the parameter when I create the cheese object I could pass in those two values and it would set name and price for me. And then I'll, just for fun, let's create another method, have this one be public, call it get name. And all this method will do is return this dot name and create a similar method called public get price Return this dot price. Of course, we're gonna have to give it the return types here. So now we can see that cheese shop is complaining at us. It's throwing a fit, constructor not defined. So the reason this is complaining now is because I've created a constructor here where it's expecting these two values to get passed in, but I'm not passing in these two values. So what I can do now is in the constructor, which are these empty parameters, and that reminds me one thing that I did forget, even if you don't create a constructor yourself, behind the scenes, Apex does it for you. So if I didn't have if I didn't write this myself, behind the scenes, something like this exists on public cheese, and it's empty, and it does absolutely nothing. And that is why we have these parameters here that are empty, because that's how it is by default. But we've overridden that now to be this. Let's make this public. So now what that means for us is that we are required now to pass in these values. It's no longer an option for us. So let's pass in a, ch a cheese name. We'll call this cheese cheddar and pass in a price. So $5.99. Let's see if some of our errors are able to go away. Constructor not defined. Let's see what we did wrong. 
So it looks like Apex is picking this up specifically as a decimal, and in the constructor I declared it as a double, and it's not liking the comparison. Honestly, I'm not too concerned about it right now, so I'll just update this to be the type decimal. It doesn't really affect me. I'll just apply the quick fix here. So now I should be able to save it, and line 3, the error is gone. So if I can do the same thing here, all these should go away. You might have seen that some of these vari variable types have methods associated with them. If I had a string called my name, I could my name dot, and as soon as I put the dot, I see all these different methods associated to the string class that I could perform on my string. So if I did this ever, I would get the fifth character in the string. So you can do the same thing when you declare your own objects as well. So you know how I had a method in here called get name? Well, if I did a system debug, I had cheddar cheese and I used the dot again, I see all the different methods that are available in the cheese class. So I can call get name and let me do the same thing here. Now we start to run into some problems, don't we? A lot of different error messages in here. So the reason we're getting this and the reason we can't save our file anymore is because we're no longer in anonymous window. We can't just write whatever we want. In our new class now, we have to define a method that we can start performing these different actions in. So let's make another method here. Salesforce should be able to compile it for me. You might be asking, why am I allowed to keep lines three through five out here, but I couldn't put lines 10 through 11 here? Three through five, five, we're declaring different variables, right? It's no different than declaring an integer. You're allowed to do that on the class level because now these are class variables, right? But as soon as you start wanting to actually do something, you're going to have to do something within a method. You can't do it on a class level. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, I think it's really just one of those things that you'll gain with practice. But on the bright side, we got rid of those seven or eight years. So now I should be able to run my cheese shop. Okay, well, now we run into another problem. I don't have an execute button here, right? So how am I going to run this piece of code? Well, there's two ways. One, if you're just testing things out, you can always use the anonymous window, but that's just really for testing purposes. Once you're actually developing a real Salesforce application, you would into an Aura component, a Lightning Web component, or Visual Force page, and this code would execute automatically. For now, since we haven't gone to those sections yet, just talk about it through the perspective of the anonymous window. So what I can do here, it's getting kind of meta now, but I can call cheese shop. By writing out this one line of code, I'll make a new instance of a cheese shop. We'll go ahead and create these three different cheeses for me and it will give me the name and the price of specifically one of the cheeses. So this kind of helps as a visual where if I had multiple shops that I wanted to create this application for, as easy as that, now have two different cheese shops that sell different types of cheeses. What I could do now is if I change the name of the variable to something that makes more sense, I could have shop one and shop. Now I have two shops that sell cheese. How cool is that? And this is really the modularization. Because I've really drilled down to the core level of a cheese and created a cheese shop class to help support that, I'm able to do something really cool like this, whereas with two lines of code, I'm able to create a cheese shop and then create three different pieces of cheese. Again, with just one line of code. That is super powerful and really helps contribute to that dry code I was talking about earlier. So let's execute this and see what we get. <gasps> we didn't get anything. Why didn't we get anything? Well, let's look back to our anonymous window. All we did was create a new cheese shop. We never said, hey, show me the cheese. So let's try to go do that, huh? That would probably be a nice line of code to add. So we can do that similar to how we did it over here. Say shop one dot show cheese. And now let's run that piece of code. Hit debug only. Boom, there it is, cheddar, $5.99. Let's see if we see all the cheeses. There they are. So now we kind of have an e-commerce sign. Not really, but sweet. So they are all there, just like I promised. Pretty cool stuff. To highlight everything, we have a wrapper class called Cheese Shop where I'm instantiating cheeses. I'm creating objects from the cheese class, which is a blueprint, where I'm passing in two values into my constructor, and the constructor knows to accept those values and set the class variables, name and price, using the this operator referencing this particular cheddar cheese, mozzarella cheese, parmesan cheese instance of a cheese class. Sets those values, 
From there, my values are set, so I am free to call any of these methods that I like.